All right, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of you for joining us for this last session of the first day of People Matters Talent Tech Evolve Virtual Conference 2018. For those of you who are joining in from a time zone where this is actually your first session, we've had a we've had quite an exciting day in terms of sessions. We'll make all the sessions that have gone so far available on demand for you. Uh, but you can you feel free to go around the conference and uh, network around. That is still available as an option. but we are here for this exciting panel discussion on from lms to learning tech stack and we are bringing you one of the most diverse or multinational panel if i can say to this uh, discussion and before i hand it over to our uh, chair or the moderator for this session let me give a brief introduction of what are we trying to achieve here in this session um with today's complex on the go learning requirements lms is no more the be all end all system but it's actually a middleware application with other systems because i'm sure you must have seen how more experiential technologies or how more experiential interfaces have started to take the front end so this panel will focus on an implementable learning stack approach and how organizations can really execute this and to chair this session we have the privilege of having with us pam boris who is a principal at bridge marketing advisors Pam is an experienced marketing leader with a demonstrated history of success in corporate training, educational technology, and HR software markets. Pam, thank you for taking the lead on this session and for helping us put this together. Thank you, and over to you to take this session forward. Thank you, Mega. So happy to be with you today and to have this all-star panel. And I want to thank all the participants as well for joining this interactive uh, panel discussion from LMS to Learning Tech Stack. Um, I am pleased to have a truly international panel of experts joining me today. As you can see, we're spread out all over the world. And let me briefly introduce each of our panelists so that you know who is on the session with us today. Um, I'll start from east to west. Um, so first, we have Dr. Morali Padmanabhan, and he is the senior VP and head of talent management for India and global head of talent development at Virtusa. and Virtusa is a leading worldwide provider of IT consulting and outsourcing services and Virtusa's job is to accelerate business outcomes for global 2000 businesses in banking financial services insurance healthcare telecom and media and Morali is joining us from Hyderabad today hi Morali thank you next uh, we have Shriram Marjan and Shriram is the head of OD and talent at Sig Combiblock Sig Combiblock is one of the world's leading system suppliers of carton packaging and filling machines for beverages and food. The company supplies complete systems including both the packaging materials and the corresponding filling machines. And Shriram is based in UAE. Hi Shriram, thank you for being here. Nice to be here. <clears throat> All right, and at this point we're going to fly across the Atlantic Ocean um and we're going to land in beautiful Toronto, Canada, which is where we'll find Lori Niles Hoffman. Lori is a data-driven learning strategist and currently serves as the director of global performance and learning at Scotia Bank. Scotia Bank is Canada's leading international bank and a leading financial services provider in North America, Latin America, the Caribbean, Central America, Asia Pac, and they have 88,000 employees, so a very large organization. Lori is a frequent author and blogger on the topic of technology-enabled learning. and i encourage you all to check out her blog which is at lori l o r i . c a and first of all you have to admire somebody who has a url like that to her personal possession um hi lori thank you hi everyone <laughs> finally our fourth panelist uh and i call him the voice of the vendor uh is todd tober from degreed Degreed is based in the Bay Area of California, although I think Todd is actually East Coast based, but that still gives us some uh, representation from the West Coast of the US. And Todd is the Vice President of Product Marketing at Degreed, which is the world's first lifelong learning platform. Before joining Degreed, he spent time as an industry analyst and led the enterprise learning practice in person um, capital research business. He's a frequent author and speaker on learning technologies and I know he has a lot to share on the topic of the learning tech stack and I'm just delighted to have a voice of the vendor to complement these excellent practitioners that we have on the call. So Todd, thanks for joining us as well. Thank you all for having me and technically I'm in San Francisco today so I do actually Oh you are. So yes. I'm in the right place. 
<laughs> Excellent, good. And that means it is quite early for you in the day. So thanks again for joining us. So the format of our presentation today is really primarily a moderated discussion and we definitely wanna hear from you. So please use the Q&A function that's embedded in the platform and you can enter your questions at any point. Um, we will take the questions from the audience uh, after we get through some initial questions that I have for the panel. And we only have an hour today and this is such a rich and meaty topic, but we will certainly try to get to um, everybody's question as best we can. But we may, apologies in advance if we can't get to all of them. But first, we're gonna start with a couple of things. One, um, we'll start with just a few slides that represent what we mean by a learning tech stack. There are various uh, examples, different organizations have different models of the learning tech stack. And we're gonna share three examples with you just to give you some context and some background on this important topic. Then we'll also, as soon as we talk about that material, we'll dive into one quick poll question because we'd like to get a sense of the understanding of this topic and the maturity on this topic with the audience. So we'll ask one quick poll question. So we'll ask you to be ready for that. We're not ready for that quite yet, but we'll be asking that in a few minutes. And then we're gonna jump right into the panel. And I know these experts have a lot to say. I guess finally, I would just say, feel free to contribute to the conversation during and after on Twitter as well. And you can use the hashtag talent tech evolve uh, to, um, for your tweets. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into the first of three examples of the learning tech stack. And this is the one that's used by Josh Burson at Burson by Deloitte, which I'm sure everybody has heard of Josh, knows Josh, reads Josh. He's one of the leaders really in our space. Um, and this is really his latest thinking. It, this is uh, 2018 learning tech segments, which is what he calls it. Um, and that's definitely one way to think about it because the learning tech stack, there's so many different areas and it doesn't always stack nice and neat on top of each other. So to think about it from a learning, um, a learning tech segments approach is a good one. So Josh starts kind of at the top. He's numbered each of the boxes conveniently for us. Um, and in the first box, he has that learning experience platform layer where companies like Degreed and others are located and that kind of very engaging front end of the, the learning system that the learners interact with. Um, also, what he calls program experience or delivery platforms, which includes some of the MOOCs and some of the other more formal ways of presenting learning. Some of the micro learning platforms, which are often short form, video based, uh, performance support type of uh, use cases. Moving to box four, he has sort of assessment, VR and development tools, some of those extra tools that do very special things like video authoring, course authoring, virtual reality collaboration. Uh, content libraries, there are many, many sources of licensable content libraries across all the different topic areas you might have need for in your organization. So the content libraries fit in there. And then sort of on the bottom or the, the base of, the, of these learning tech segments are the LMS platforms, which we're all familiar with. And Josh includes both the traditional and the sort of more modernized um, LMS platforms, as well as the learning record store, which is um, you know, a critical component that a lot of organizations are starting to use to uh, really manage all, a lot of their user data and, and content data. So one structure here of the learning of a learning tech segments approach. Our second example is um, uh, the learning technology ecosystem. And while this is a busy graphic, I think it captures the complexity and the nuances of the learning tech stack. Um, so I like this one and, you know, for full disclosure, this comes from a company called Training Orchestra, which is a client of mine. I do some work for them, but this graphic is really not about Training Orchestra and the brands that are represented in each of the boxes here are really just examples. But if we start at the bottom and work our way up, really the focus is on building a very solid foundation of uh, platforms and technologies and systems that are used by the back office, used by the L&D leaders for the things that they need to do. So whether that's training resource management, assessment, benchmarking, learning record store, you'll notice there's some similarities with Josh's slide there. And then we build up from there. As you build up, you get closer to the front office or to interacting with the learner. So training resources are sort of stacked on top of that, all the content libraries, training marketplaces, 
some of the authoring tools that are out there, and then the learning delivery. And you'll notice that sort of smack dab in the middle of this graphic are those LMSs, right? So the LMS is a component of the stack, but no longer, again, the, the, the be all end all, as Mega said, kicking off our session. It's really sort of a middleware approach. And they're doing learning management, not learner engagement. Um, that learner experience layer, that top green layer that you see there, which includes the learning experience platforms like Degreed, as well as sometimes a company's intranet or, or internet uh, website can be delivering some of this content. And that's what the learners see. And hopefully our learners never have to see the complexity below that layer. They can just engage with beautiful, intuitive, learner-centric front end. And then we do have a third, and this is Degreed's um, future-proof learning technology ecosystem. And since we're lucky enough to have Todd joining us today, I'm going to ask him to, to walk us through Degreed's thinking and approach. Sure. Um, so first of all, thanks very much for, for having me, Pam, um, and, and for sharing this. So this uh, is obviously a bit of an eye chart, uh, and it's, um, it, it's a lot more complicated than the other two. The way that, that we built this was... Um, I th we took sort of two different principles. One was um, we were responding to questions from clients, from potential clients about um, how to differentiate all these new tools and technologies in the market. When you go to trade shows, when you start looking at um, vendor websites, a lot of us look and sound the same lately. Uh, and it's very difficult for people to tell um, vendors apart, even when they are quite different because the messages have gotten very sort of generic. Um, and so we were trying to help our customers understand what the different tools and technologies are, but also more importantly, how do they fit into helping them do their jobs and how do they all connect to each other? And so the second um, uh, principle or the second approach that we took here was in the uh, learning strategy documents that our customers share with us in the uh, RFPs that we get, Sometimes the clients share their vision of what they're trying to build, their, their ecosystem, their stack, whatever you want to call it. And so this was actually developed as sort of a composite of about 20, 25 of those um, that my team put together. <clears throat> and so the other, uh, the last thing I think that, that differentiates this from the other two is that this represents what we think is the new way that learning and development organizations are working, um, not necessarily the, uh, the traditional approach. So the traditional approach, for example, um, a lot of the tools are built around the ADDIE model, right? So LMS is for delivering, for example, assessments for analyzing, for example. Um, and so what we think is happening is that there is a more organic, more continuous approach to doing the job of learning that's emerging. Uh, the person analysts refer to this as creating context, not delivering content. Um, CEB calls it... Um, uh, their franchise model or um, supplying, uh, uh, enabling learning, not supplying it. <clears throat> so there's lots of research out there that, that kind of speaks to that, that model. Um, but what we think is happening is that there's a sort of, there's two bookends on this process that haven't traditionally been there. One is to more continuously sense and understand needs as they emerge. And so for example, at the bottom left, what we've added to the mix is um, a box we called intent which are ways to understand what people want to learn next. Um, a few weeks ago, I was at Unilever in uh, London and they were telling me how they were looking at search data, uh, failed search data to understand what people were looking for but couldn't find inside the company, for example. But there's lots of other tools and technologies that you can use to understand people's intent. Um, there's a lot of the traditional tools, but are, you know, some of them are, are being upgraded and modernized for understanding people's performance and potential best example of that is some of the newer goal setting platforms that you see out in the, the marketplace, particularly when you start to get out of L and D and into the talent management side of things a little bit more. Um, when it comes to building content, uh, there's a lot more diversity in terms of the formats these days than there used to be. A lot of the traditional authoring tools were built for developing courses. Um, very often everywhere we go lately, we see clients also using video platforms to capture um, events like this one to capture um, more professionally uh, uh, created videos, um, but also to put together blended programs. That's where some of those MOOC platforms uh, come into play, for example. And increasingly, we're hearing chatter, although I haven't seen a lot of activity yet, uh, around things like AR and VR and chatbots. 
Um, so you can also still buy a lot of that content, but there's also been a big explosion in consumer friendly content that's available directly both to individuals as well as organizations, again, in a lot of new formats. And then a lot of uh, other platforms, including ours, allow you to pull all of that stuff together to curate it, mix and match, put it into playlists. There are consumer uh, applications that allow you to do that, including on mobile devices, but there are also industrial strength applications that give you a little bit more administrative support for doing that. Once all that content is built, it needs to be uh, put together uh, and you still need to manage events. Those events are typically still live events like classes and courses um, or digital content. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of um, uh, totally new uh, categories in that box, the number three, but there are a lot of new uh, approaches to doing some of those older things. The learning content management system, um, market, for example, has, has seen a little bit of, of innovation in the last couple of years, um, a lot of lighter weight tools, for example. Um, and we're starting to see some tools that are, are being used um, to run campaigns a little bit like marketing automation software does. Um, category number four is connecting all of that content uh, and the people using the content to each other. Typically, we're seeing that happen for two reasons, either for collaboration purposes um, or for coaching. So we see lots of organizations using tools like Yammer, Jive, Slack um, to collaborate around content, but we also are starting to see a lot more traction in platforms that are explicitly designed for the relationship and to guide the relationship between a coach or a mentor and uh, an employee. Um, then you come to what we call uh, the engage category. Josh calls it the experience layer. Um, there's LMSs that do elements of this. There are um, enterprise content management tools like um, SharePoint and Confluence that can do pieces of this. There are custom learning portals that a lot of clients, uh, a lot of organizations still use. And then there's tools like ours that have sort of carved out a new space in that category. Um, we also see a lot of activity uh, lately in taking that information and connecting it to other things. And so there's all the traditional assessment and reporting tools. But increasingly what we're seeing, like you said uh, earlier, is tools like LRSs and learning analytics platforms to understand the impact of that learning and to, and to turn that into data that business users can transact on, can make decisions based on. And then crucially, what we see missing from a lot of these other diagrams is that our clients are asking us to take all of that information and to turn all of the unstructured information about what people are learning and to turn that into data that they can use to feed into other processes and systems so that the organization can make decisions. So they want structured information about people's skills, not just their learning activities, so they can enrich their employee profiles and their HCM systems. They wanna be able to add that data to <clears throat> succession management uh, processes. So there's a lot of interesting work happening with the data itself, not just on the analytics side, but to plug that in and connect uh, learning activities to business operations. And then, um, the, the last piece of it is, is on the individual side. As individuals start to have to take more ownership and more um, control of their own development, um, what we're seeing is that a lot of them want information about their learning activity to make smarter choices. And so um, you have things like badging platforms that let them own uh, some of their skills data, uh, digital portfolios. We've got a, a, a platform that allows you to get your skills certified and rated. And so there's lots of interesting ways to feed that information, not just to the organization, but increasingly to individuals as well. And so uh, when this is uh, depicted, I know this is very complicated, but the idea here is that this is more of a continuous cycle and taking that data then feeds back into uh, understanding what people then want to learn next and to you know, systematically start to close down some of the, the gaps in skill sets that, that organizations have. Fantastic, Todd. I mean, thank you so much for taking us through that. I think that kind of holistic approach, including the beginning, um, the end, and then making it a, it a round trip journey, if you will, is, um, is really important. So thank you for taking us through that. Um, okay, so at this point, we want to hear briefly from you. So I'm going to ask the host to please put up the live poll on your screen. And I'm going to ask, what stage are you and your organization at regarding this learning tech stack approach? Um, and, you know, just pick the one that's best fit for you. Are you learning about this topic for the very first time today? 
uh, are you actively researching to see if this learning tech stack approach is applicable for your organization? Are you planning already on implementing a learning tech, tech, tech stack strategy within the next year? Are you in the process of implementing right now? Or has your organization actually already implemented and is using a learning tech stack? So when the poll comes up, um, let's see if we're seeing the results. All right, so if you can uh, just choose the one that's the best fit for you. Uh, again, it could be any of these, there's no wrong answers. We're just trying to get a sense for the maturity uh, of the people on the discussion today, just so we can guide our questions and our responses. Um, so let's see what kind of answers we're getting. All right, I, I am not seeing, I'm seeing the poll, but I'm not seeing the answers come in. Just ask if any of my panelists are the panelists, are you seeing the answers or are you just seeing the questions? Okay, so just the questions. So I'm just gonna ask our host if you can let us know when you have some answers uh, coming in and we will go accordingly. Now we're happy to speak to, to, to this topic at any level, but we just wanted to make sure that we don't talk a lot about sort of optimizing a learning tech stack if people are at the very beginning. Uh, and we're happy to share, you know, the most uh, early stage planning uh, ways to conceptualize and think about how this can work in your organization if people are more at the beginning of their journeys on this topic. Sure. So, Pam, I think we've started getting responses to the question. Okay. And most of the people are saying that they're actively researching to see uh, if a learning tech stack can actually work for them. Okay. That's the second option. Perfect. Okay. That's the most popular option. Excellent. Okay, great. And that was, I guess, what I was sort of expecting, right? So it's nice yeah. to, to have that validated. And I think the, the panelists we have have a lot of expertise because many of them are in that that stage themselves, right? And yeah. I'm sure Todd will inspire us with some very aspirational organizations that are doing, um, you know, uh, things much more at a, at a, at a more mature level. But Absolutely. great, we will certainly speak to that. So if we can um, remove, oh, sorry, Magna. Yeah, so I was just saying that the second option that we're getting, Pam, is really that a lot of people are learning about tech stack for the first time. So I said it, I thought it was important for you to know as a panel. So you may want to keep that into consideration. Uh, okay. To actually talk. Perfect. And, and I think for anybody who's learning about it for the first time, uh, hopefully we'll give you some good background. There's a lot of good information out there. We shared three of the models that are being used. There are others. And uh, it's, it's still a relatively new topic. So please don't feel like you're behind because you're learning about this topic for the first time. All right, great. So we'll close out the poll there and um, we will move on to the discussion. So again, use the q and I've got some prepared questions for our fantastic panelists, um, but please do use the Q&A. And in about probably 15 to 20 minutes, oh, thank you, thanks for sharing that, that's great. Um, that was great. In about 15 to 20 minutes, we'll start taking your questions. So get your questions ready, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, so my first question to the panelists, uh, and I'll probably ask each of the panelists, each of the practitioner panelists to speak on this topic, is, you know, what needs arose in your organization that made you look at a learning tech stack approach? Was there some limitation with your LMS? Was it demand from your stakeholders or learners? Or was it something else completely? And Shriram, if you don't mind, I think I might start with you on that particular topic. Sure, sure. Uh, Pam, thanks for bringing me in. So, uh, a great question. And for us, actually, it was a little bit of both. Uh, the limitation of the existing LMS and, and the stakeholders' demand. Uh, so, when we went back and did a little bit of analysis, honestly, the limitation of the LMS predominantly came in because the expectations of the learners are changing at a rapid pace, right? So when you go back and look at what are some of the things that influence this, uh, we broadly categorize that under two, which is essentially to go back and say, what are the stakeholders from an impact perspective expecting from us in terms of a learning strategy? And what are the learners really looking forward to in terms of a change and all of that, right? So some of the things that we got from the leadership in terms of expectations was to go back and say, can you come back and give us something that's low cost, but scalable and effective? Is there some kind of reporting that you can go back and do real time in terms of impact that you create for things that you go back and deliver from a learning perspective? And of course, can you go back and start 
profiling people for us in terms of their learning behaviors and the impact that they show on the job for us to be able to go back and see and look out for potential within the organization. So those are some of the broad things that we got as, as, as expectations from the stakeholders. Learners, on the other hand, were very keen on uh, being able to access learning anytime, anywhere, when they want. Uh, some of the other things that they came back and asked were around, can you chunk it up for me? Uh, I, I don't have the time to go back and spend two days in the classroom or travel into a different country to attend a training program. Uh, some of the other things were around, how do I constantly learn from my peers? Can you come back and give me a platform uh, which enables uh, social learning? Uh, and of course, as, as uh, uh, the OD team, uh, the one thing that we wanted to do was to go back and also start rewarding positive behaviors uh, and, and you know, bring in the gamification concept um, uh, into our learning strategy. Uh, so, so those were the broad behaviors, you know, and with these expectations changing, uh, uh, both in terms of the learner experience and the value we bring to uh, the business as a learning function, those were some of the predominant factors that we kept in mind when we uh, started exploring uh, uh, the entire learning tech stack approach uh, at SIG Combi Global. That's great, Sharam. Thank you. Um, Dr. Morelli, can I ask you if, if it was a similar journey for you at Virtusa or were there some different considerations? Yeah, so um, um, given that Virtusa is in IT services uh, space <clears throat> and we do build a uh, lot of uh, IT based uh, solutions for our customers and most of our workforce is engaged in uh, developing these kind of systems. Um, so predominantly, if you look at the IT space right now, uh, we can abstract uh, all systems into three levels. You have the systems of record, which is you know basically record keeping. Then you have the middle layer, which is systems of engagement, which is kind of drastically changing, uh, given that you have mobile first, uh, you know, devices and stuff like that. The third piece that is getting added on is the systems of intelligence. Uh, so how can you how can you get enough intelligence from the system uh, so that we are able to make choices? Uh, so given that uh, our workforce is really engaged in developing these kind of uh, you know, solutions for our customers, um, you know, they really demand a similar service uh, from, uh, from the internal service provider. So we have no choice but to, you know, but to go the learning uh, tech stack way uh, to ensure that we are able to create that experience uh, for our uh, learners in, internally. Also, I think uh, technology in today's world has allowed us to personalize, uh, you know, uh, the services, right? Uh, so I think every learner can choose what he or she wants to learn rather than being told by a department or a manager as to what needs to be learned. Uh, I think learning has become really pervasive and technology enables that. And uh, that's where I think uh, uh, this uh, learning tech stack is very, very important. Yeah, great, great points, especially around, you know, the makeup of your learner base, right? So they're building and deploying these kind of solutions for your clients. So you have a very demanding learner base. So very interesting challenge that you have there. Uh, Lori, how about you? And how about um, Scotiabank or some of the other organizations you've worked at? Certainly. So, um, I mean, to, to touch on, I, I think uh, both, both uh, Suram and uh, Dr. Morali have really touched on the main points. So I won't go too far into those. I, I think for, for us, it was really realizing we weren't getting a return on investment. If we put something on our learning management system, I once did the, uh, the, the counting. It took a, a learner 11 clicks on average to get to a piece of content. And, and that is just unacceptable. And, and, and so people just didn't bother. Uh, I mean, it, it, there, there was no reason. So, and we found we had, um, and I, I've done the math on it in a couple of organizations, we, content that sits on an LMS has a less than 1% return to rate. That means that people take it only because they have to and less than 1% ever go back to it. But yet, if I could put content on say that like we have um, workplace uh, for Facebook sort of uh, platform and that's not an LMS, but I found if I started putting video content there or an article on there, all of a sudden the engagement level shot up. So that led me to look at this as a learning stack and saying, you know, it's not working, but I still need to have both. I need to have the tracking. I can't get the tracking from the, you know, if I put it on, on something external and then I can't, then it's a way, but it's on the LMS, nobody's using it. So it's sort of this, things don't fit together. 
I used to famously say my prediction and for 2017 was the LMS will die, and I was wrong. <laughs> and, but I, I think, though, what we're doing, though, is I love the term that the LMS is becoming that middleware because we just have to look at how people are getting to the content. It's not about us. It is about the learner. And they're telling us very clearly with their digital body language what they want to go towards, um, and hence the, the, the learning stack. Fantastic. And Todd, I'll just ask you, is this consistent with what you typically hear from the companies you deal with? Anything different or anything you would add? Um, no, I think it's all very consistent. Um, I, I think uh, um, Sriram's starting point was probably the, the most common one, right? Which is to understand a combination of the needs of the organization, what are the requirements for the behaviors they're trying to develop, and also understand, and, and what Lori just said, that digital body language, understanding how people actually behave when it comes time to figuring out what it is they need to do to do their jobs better. Um, and so that, when, when, when companies start to understand those things better, they start to understand that classes and courses and LMSs are not the only solution that they need anymore. Um, and it starts to get very clear very quickly what, what other capabilities they need uh, on the team, um, what other processes they need to start um, adopting, and, and therefore what other tools um, they need to start looking at. Yep, great, good, okay. So this question may be a little bit in the weeds, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Um, so what were the data considerations that you had to think about in taking this approach? Did you have to do any data normalization, any data mapping? Did you use any data standards? Um, you know, what was the role of the larger HR tech stack? Um, and is there is there identified within your organization the one system that is the master system of record? So a lot of questions sort of embedded in that one. And if Dr. Morelli, if I could start with you on that one, if you don't mind picking up that question. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think, um... One a consideration that we had uh, when we are trying to implement, uh, you know, HR stack, not necessarily just the learning stack, uh, is the points of integration. Uh, we really don't want to have too many points of integration um, because if you really have too many points of integration, uh, it comes at a cost, right? There is going to be, uh, you know, data data loss or time delay in terms of being uh, being able to keep data, uh, you know, up to date. Uh, so that was one key consideration, and uh, we really wanted to keep one system of record. So we went in, went ahead with Oracle. Uh, so Oracle is our uh, ERP platform on which uh, you know all these stacks are built. Um, so uh, so that was one one uh, thing. And and any organization I think uh, doesn't really implement a green stack, uh, greenfield learning tech stack, right? I mean they really just don't go and actually implement a tech stack. Normally they would have a piece of an LMS or a, or a homegrown system or, or some database on which they would really want to build this. So, um, so considerations of data migration, data flow, access to data, I think those are some of those uh, key issues which will have to be borne in mind when we really go in for a learning tech stack. Right, I think that's a great point that you raised to that um, organizations don't build a learning tech stack from a green field, right? They're often starting with some system or set of systems that either they have or they're stuck with or, and they're trying to make it do more. So I think that for the, for the people in the audience who are thinking about this approach, think about what systems you have in-house already that you need to build off of, that you need to optimize. I think that's a great point. Um, uh, Shuram, what about your approach uh, the, on the data question? So uh, I think uh, Murli touched upon some of those points, but, but some of the other things that we went back and, and sort of considered, uh, uh, because increasingly what we've, been, uh, what we've been questioned on is what's the impact, what's the value you bring to the business, right? So one of the things that we went back and, and started out with was to go back and say, uh, what's the average number of learning days uh, employees consume in a year? Uh, and, and what are some of the reasons uh, keeping employees from accessing as much learning as they need to? Uh, uh, is it a reduction in cost? Is it, is it their challenge to be at a certain location? Um, so those are some of the things that we consider. How can we sort of get the needle to start moving up as far as consumption of learning is concerned across the organization? 
the second thing that we went back and considered was to, uh, you know, we constantly get this challenge, which hasn't been any different uh, amongst most organizations that I worked for is how do you sustain the, the revived behaviors that you begin to experience inside a classroom outside of it? Uh, how do you sustain learning on the job? How do you get people to, to stay motivated when they are, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the job? Uh, the third, of course, was cost optimization. And my learning and, and, and the organization's learning over the last two years of, of taking this approach is so while it may come across as being a heavy investment that you make initially, but you really begin to realize your cost and the impact it has on, on people's behavior over a two to three year time span. Uh, so, so for us, really to summarize learning days, how do you sustain behavior that you see in the classroom outside of it? And, and given that we want to optimize costs, what are some of the te technological tools you can start bringing in uh, to be able to do more impactful things at a lesser cost? So those were some things that we considered when we were looking at the learning stack approach. Okay, terrific. Laurie, anything you'd like to add to, to this on this topic? Absolutely. Um, I think uh, the approach uh, that I've also taken uh, in addition is every organization has its own sort of cultural DNA. So it's easy to look at some of these recommendations of all the things that, that you should have. But I think you also have to look at how a particular organization functions and how they best communicate before you start even considering what should be in your learning stack. And what I mean by that is by nature, some organizations, you know, operate and navigate very comfortably in, in a digital format. They're very comfortable, you know, blogging and posting and commenting and chatting. Some other organizations that are maybe more risk adverse, that necessarily behavior won't necessarily happen. So I think it, it's, it's about understanding. Um, so, so one of the things that I I always say is, is follow the learner where they, where they are. So rather than implementing a new, a new platform right away from scratch, look at the things that they're already gravitating towards. Are there some Slack groups that are sort of, you know, popping up places? Are there places within your intranet that people tend to go to? And once you start looking at all that, that data together, that gives you a better feel. So when you look at a diagram, say like that Todd has, you can look at some of those pieces to pick out and say, what would, what would be work best and, and what would fit in seamlessly? Because there's nothing worse than trying to fit both a platform or a, a new solution um, that, that doesn't match the, the behaviors of, of the organization that already exists. Because now you're trying to change for two things. Yeah, great advice. Definitely keep those cultural factors in mind. And, and as you said, they're sort of all over the place. They're, they're already visible, right? Where are the learners hanging out? Where are the employees hanging out? And go to those places. Super smart advice. Yeah. That's terrific. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna, thing I would gonna, gonna, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm just gonna go quickly, oh, so go ahead. go ahead, Laurie, I'm, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say very quickly, if you want to see, I would suggest even doing like a quick LinkedIn search or whatever, and you'll, I bet you'll find that your, your companies have sort of secret alumni or secret associations that, that are on there. So that's an interesting insights. Yeah. Absolutely. On LinkedIn or Facebook, there's all sorts of third party places where people are hanging out that you may not know about. Okay, terrific. Um, so what are, my next question is, what are the limitations or risks of a learning tech strategy? What, I guess, what did you learn that you wish you knew at the beginning of this process? Since so many of our listeners today are at the kind of the beginning start of their, uh, of their search. Um, uh, yeah. Would you like to take so, that, Sharam? Sure. Um, so, so, and I'm going to talk about two tools uh, that, that we've sort of, uh, you also showed on your uh, uh, first slide, uh, Pam. Uh, so our learning with Exonify, that's one of the tools that we're using. Uh, uh, it creates a lot of excitement. It creates a lot of engagement. But some of these platforms can turn out to be content hungry monsters, right? You have to constantly keep feeding them. Uh, because, because I, I mean, as much as, uh, uh, you know, uh, bite-sized learning brings in a lot of impact. It means that people who are actually feeding that platform have to do a lot of work uh, to keep feeding the content because you have learners coming back and asking you, great, I've completed what I was supposed to complete. This is the reward that I've got. I'm beginning to see the improvement. When are you launching the next module, right? So these platforms can turn out to be really content hungry monsters. So you must watch out uh, in terms of what are you committing to the organization how many learners are you actually taking on to that platform? You know, is it sustainable? Do you have the bandwidth to be able to uh, live up to the expectations and the excitement that it brings with it? Uh, with something like a Coursera, uh, there's a plethora of courses, again, 
people want to consume too much, right? Uh, because there's a lot of enthusiasm that comes in. So the skill also lies in how do you get people to understand that less is actually more in a situation like this? Mm. Because of course, in that, I mean, the beauty about these tools is that they're sustained over a period of time. You, you consume learning over a time of three to four months. Uh, there are projects that come in. Uh, but when they look at all these big universities out there, you know, it, it just creates a lot of enthusiasm. So how do you also manage that enthusiasm for people to hold back and say, great, you have access to all of this, but how do you make it relevant to what you actually need rather than learning now becoming a fancy list of things that you want to accomplish? So I think those are some of the things that people should definitely watch out for and consider. How do you educate the organization around things like that becomes very, very important. Right, right. Lori, how about you? What were some of the learnings? What did you wish you knew at the beginning of the process? Um, I think the main one is uh, technology will not just magically solve it. So there is no tool or a product on any of these lists. They will, you know, that, that will just, you, you just pop it up and people log in and it will magically all happen. So I think, you know, in combination Oh, Lori, I think you might be frozen. Yep. Have I unfrozen? Uh, yep, you're unfrozen okay. now. Yep. <laughs> it, it, well, we have snow today, so maybe that, that's, that's why I'm from freezing in Canada. Um, but you, you, so what I was saying there is that you need to have, for example, a learning community manager, somebody who's seeding conversation, who's managing conversation to get things going. Um, you can't just, you know, launch it and, and forget it. And I think also too, understanding there's a lot of change management process that goes, goes into this. Um, and you need to be thinking about what that strategy is. Think of how you're marketing this to people. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of turning it on and people will find it and do it. Yeah. And a lot of the lessons you've said are, pretty much to any learning product ever, right? And this Absolutely. sounds like the things I heard five, 10 years ago about mobile learning, about social learning, about, about you know, e-courses in general. You build it and they will come as a fallacy, right? So. Completely, completely. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dr. Morelli, how, how, how about uh, your additional advice on this topic of the, the things you wish you knew at the beginning of the process? Yeah, so um, I think um, um, one is that uh, it's a huge change management uh, from supervised learning to allowing the learners to learn uh, on their own, right? Uh, typically, uh, uh, L&D divisions, uh, you know, functions across the organization that I worked for uh, have been uh, keeping a watch of what people learn or kind of, you know, force feed uh, learners into what they should be learning. Uh, I think this, the, this is a whole paradigm shift where learners uh, actually go and consume uh, content uh, as and when they need it and from wherever they want it um, and it's not necessarily from within the enterprise um, so that becomes a you know very difficult kind of a, a challenge to work with um, because uh, managers want to know what they have learned why they have learned what are the outcomes what is the competency update and, and things like that so getting your internal competencies aligned to the all the content that's available in the universe is a huge challenge if somebody goes and just does a, you know, a, a course on a MOOC and says, you know, uh, this is this helps me achieve this proficiency in this competency. We had no clue about it. Uh, so, so I think uh, those are some of the challenges that we have. Uh, so, how do you how do you really keep the system dynamic, uh, and and uh, and have a mechanism of uh, being able to on the fly uh, map content to competencies that you have, right? Uh, that's one. The second thing is new competencies that come up. Uh, many a times, uh, especially in the technology space that we work in, uh, there are new technologies that are evolving. You have deep learning, machine learning, AI, and all whatnot. And uh, especially the younger uh, the workforce is going and consuming content at a very rapid pace. Um, you know, before even uh, we could roll out, uh, there are a few, few guys who have just gone and done a course on Coursera and they have the certificate saying that you know, we have completed the course. So uh, keeping in pace with uh, you know, what's happening outside the enterprise, uh, and, 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 and you know, that's, I think that's a challenge. And probably we should have planned it better. Uh, and and, and uh, so 
So when you are really rolling out a tech stack, my advice would be uh, if you can keep your com competency manage or competency model dynamic uh, in terms of being able to map courses as in when the system uh, gets in, gets gets the intelligence of it, right? Uh, so how can you dynamically map that? I don't think we still have an answer to that. Uh, it's still manually managed. So it, it can cause some uh, process issues. That's one. The second issue, I think this is a perennial issue that we have in IT services, is the security issue. Mm. Uh, we do have customers who have their uh, you know, uh, offshore development centers within our premises. So for example, I would have an uh, I would have my you know office, but within my office there will be a bunch of learners who have absolutely no access to my systems, primarily because they're working on client network, and especially if you're working in banks and insurance and you know telco, highly uh, controlled networks, uh, and security is is a big issue. Um, so how do you how do you really ensure that you're able to make these uh, you know systems pervasive and people are able to access content? Uh, and and we are able to record it. I think uh, right. these are some of the things that we need to think through before we move on. Great, great contributions from all of you guys. Todd, I'll, I'll just ask if before we go to some of our questions from the audience, and we have quite a few. Todd, anything you you would have to add on this issue of limitations and risks and um, things people should think about so that they uh, think try to think about these things in advance to minimize them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think if it was just one thing, Pam, what I would suggest is don't just think about this as how do you add more stuff. Um, this is an opportunity to rethink the way the whole system of learning in your organization works. Um, and if you think about that as a, a pie chart filled with all of the different activities and processes and tools, um, you want to redistribute the pie for the business and the operations that you need in the future, not the ones that you've had in the past. And so some things go away, some things get smaller, um, and, and then you have to add some new things as well. So it's not just a question of bolt one more thing on top or plug one more thing in on the side. Um, it's not a question of content. Um, you know, content you know, in, in L&D tends to be um, something people obsess over. But, um, you know, when you take one step back, everybody recognizes that it's a small part of how people actually learn and develop on the job. Um, a lot of what we see happening in these ecosystems is not just plugging in more content, but it's making space for more experiential learning, more social learning opportunities, more self-directed learning opportunities. And so this is an opportunity to redistribute the whole pie. Um, and change the way that, that things operate. It's not just a, a question of um, adding one more piece of, you know, uh, you know, a condiment on top. Right, right, which certainly underscores what um, Dr. Morali was saying about this being a change management um, effort, for sure. Yeah, very Great. much. Um, so some of the questions, we've gotten quite a few questions from our audience, um, and I, I'm sure we won't get to them all, but I'm getting several questions around connecting learning with performance and learning with rewards, right? So has it changed your rewards and recognition approach? Have you tied it to performance management at all? So Lori, I don't know if there's any, anything relevant to share there from your organization. I, I'm, I'm going to be honest and say we, we, we dabbled in a little bit of that, but I found in the, the companies that I've been consulting with, the idea of rewarding for education doesn't create the learning culture that, that we want. It becomes people doing it. It's almost like you know gamification. They're doing it for the badges and the, the, the quick win. They're not doing it for the sake of learning. So I have shied a, a, away from, from, from that. Um, we, we tend to do more the rewards as if when they're applying it, they're actually doing it you know that that that's where the the connection uh occurs but we don't reward for for taking a course or, or getting an accreditation we may uh you know from people do an academic achievement or they do uh they've graduated from a program we do an acknowledgement um which i think is, is just a is just a best practice but um beyond that no okay no problem uh, Sharam, how about you? Any anything related to rewards, recognition, and tying learning with performance that's a result of taking the learning tech stack approach? No, and, I, and I just want to build on what Laurie said, because for us, uh, I've experienced both uh, Laurie and, and I think at what stage of learning do you reward people is largely also a function of the organization maturity, right? I mean, uh, how mature are your learners? Is there a drive towards learning? 
because in a situation like that in my earlier organizations you pretty much go back and reward people to not consume learning but 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 to be able to showcase impact and say this is the value that you bring uh, but in organizations where learning has been a challenge getting people inside the classroom has been a challenge we've actually rewarded a lot of people to consume learning on exonify we we uh, gamified the entire situation it's surprisingly led to a very uh 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 you know enthused culture around some of the topics that we go back and and uh, start talking about for example values um people now talk the same language be it while they're making a coffee or when they're smoking a cigarette in the smoking zone you know that's it keeps people engaged uh uh and 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 contrary to to uh what some of the other companies may have seen uh it drives other people to participate and say you know what i want my name on that wall of fame i i want to be able to bring about an impact in what i do so some of the things that we've used as rewards is is something as simple as sending out a letter to their family saying this person is the champion of the month and 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 uh, uh these are some of the things that this person accomplished over the last one month to to uh giving away iPods um uh what we've also done is we've sort of uh uh created different tiers around rewards so there's a monthly reward there's a quarterly reward and then there's a yearly reward uh so so of course the more you sustain the learning behavior that you started out with at the beginning of the year uh pretty much decides the kind of rewards you give people out doesn't have to have a budget i think more than applying money if you apply your thought in how you want to reward people uh there are very creative ways in terms of like i said uh sharing it with their family uh lunch with the ceo shadowing your boss for a day those some of the things that we go back and do to be able to or, or taking the uh, uh if you have reserved parking uh, you know taking the ceo's parking lot for a day uh you know some simple things like that uh really motivate people to sort of go back and uh, uh you know start learning and 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 uh, making a difference great advice great and how about you morally how about, how about at vertusa anything any ties to rewards recognition or performance management um so we have not uh, we don't really uh, you know have a reward and recognition program for learning uh, for us uh, so if you if you really learn something a niche today uh, it automatically gets uh, gets you the you know gets you a better pay because uh, skills are high skills niche skills are in high demand and uh, you get prepared to be put on the next uh, you know next project that the company is going to work on uh, so so that's it's a it's an inherent uh, reward that mechanism that's kind of tied in so for example if you're a if you're a, a, a you know full stack developer on a legacy technology uh, you know it's it's in your best interest to upgrade or, or update yourself with the latest uh, and especially areas like machine learning uh, artificial intelligence uh, rpa for example robotic process automation these Uh, these the contents uh, around these are consumed at uh, at a very fast pace we don't even have to uh, you know market them people figure out find out where it is and and they just go and consume and what it does is that they're able to uh, they kind of equip themselves with the skills that are required for the next project right so so it 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 adds value to you yourself you are learning something very new and you're also contributing significantly to the company so uh, we have not really tied up with uh, with the rewards mechanism but however uh, there is some rewards uh, you know built into into the learning itself what really happens because of this uh, people swing towards a, a certain kind of learning uh, more uh, than uh, what is really fully needed for them so for example they would not really look at uh, professional skills development uh, they would not do any uh, leadership uh, development these we, we need to kind of you know push it so that, that we are seeing a very different kind of a challenge that uh, at at workplace very good very good excellent well our time is running extremely short i knew our time would be fast with all these experts on such a exciting topic so the last question that we have from the audience and todd i think i'm going to give you the last word on this one so um this is the question from the audience which i think is a really interesting one you know do you see a robust learning tech stack evolve as a completely self managed solution in the future a stack that reads into user feedback reviews deletes orders and refreshes content all by itself without much human intervention so what are your thoughts on that 
<laughs> I think if it's going to be possible, it's, it's going to be um, a long way out. I, I was sitting yesterday with our um, product management team, and there's still a lot of really basic functionality that, that people expect that um, is, is a lot harder and a lot um, more work than most people realize. So the ability to completely automate a lot of these things is, you know, a long, long way out, probably further out than driverless cars. Right. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good one. That's a good benchmark for us to keep an eye on as an industry then. Uh, and then just, uh, Lori, I know you're also a futurist as well. Any, any thoughts on this magical, as you said earlier, you know, nothing, nothing, is, nothing is magic with technology. So, so what do you think about this magic approach? Um, you know what, I actually, I mean, I, we're heading in that direction. I, I agree with Todd, it's a long way off, but I think you're going to see more and more increments happening that way. I, I almost picture like all these, these the things in the learning stack um, almost being like the internet of things, if, that, if that's a successful analogy, where things are going to start feeding into each other. So we're going to be able to understand that if somebody hasn't taken their vacations day, vacation days allotment, maybe we send them suddenly a piece on, you know, work-life balance or all these things. And I think those things are, are going to happen. It's a long way off, but it's a fascinating, fascinating uh, concept. And I think, I think we're on the road. Yeah, well, maybe we can reconvene this panel in five years and talk about that topic. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I think I'm going to wrap up and hand it back to Mega to, to, to issue us out. But I want to thank Saram, Lori, Todd, Dr. Morali for joining me today. It was a fascinating conversation. I hope you got some value out of it, and I hope our viewers did too. So Mega, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. And I wish uh, I could request each of an, each one in our audience and all of us to give a huge round of applause to all our <laughs> panelists. I think it was a fantastic discussion. I know this was a topic where you had to demystify the topic also to the uh, to the audience, but I think you did a fab job. Thank you so much. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the last session of this first day of People Matters Talent Tech evolve virtual conference 2018 and as i can see the sun and the moon moving around across the world because light going dim at one place light going up at another place uh, i'm sure uh, you have enjoyed the day today with us uh, for those of you who've been with us throughout the day there is still opportunity to go around network around because we will have folks uh, in the networking zone the partners are available in the exhibit hall so go visit the stalls and experience some of the products some of them which we discussed today are already there in the exhibit hall so please go and experience them and uh, before we close let me share the secret code for this session uh, for the leaderboard contest to win an xbox the secret code for this session is hashtag lms7 the so it's not a very difficult uh, word to catch so i don't really need to spell it it's hashtag lms numeral seven and with that, let me, before we close, let me take this opportunity to thank all our partners who've worked so closely with us over the last few months to help us put this together, uh, this entire conference, this entire experience. So please join me in thanking our Diamond Partner Oracle, our Talent Search Partner Indeed, Education Technology Partner Degreed, Learning and Technology Partner N Paradigm, HR Tech Partner People Strong, Talent Assessment Partner Metal, Digital Learning Partner Skillsoft, a startup exhibitors time to know and tomorrow co create. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great day or an evening ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.